Hey, tonight we're going to talk about overflowing declarations of faith. Amen. Our declarations of faith have to overflow in our life. We cannot be shy about the declarations of faith in our life. We got to believe it, we got to receive it, and then we got to declare it. We need to be speaking to our circumstances all the time. We got to be telling the world what, what the Word says. We got to be telling ourselves what the Word says. We got to be telling the devil what the Word says. The Word of God has to be big in our mouth and we have to declare it in an overflowing fashion such that every breath we speak, every word that we speak is filled with the Word of God. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I say where there's the Word of God, there's life. I say we, you can speak life into your situation when you're speaking the Word of God into your situation. You say, well, my situation doesn't have much life in it. Well, speak the Word into it. Bring it back to life. Resurrection power. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Glory to God. God. How about, let's speak some life into our future. Let's speak some life into our finances. Let's speak some life into our health, into our body, into our marriage, to our children, to our circumstance. Oh, let's speak, let's speak to the impossible and make it possible. Let's speak to, the, to whatever it might be and whatever the situation is. Let's speak to it and say, situation, you become godly. Hallelujah. So we're going to talk today about overflowing declarations of faith. Hallelujah. And the church said, praise the Lord. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. We'll read 4, four and 5. I'm borrowing from last week a little bit, but I just wanted to touch on something and bring it back to your remembrance. Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. Now we're talking about the people of Judah returning back to the land from the, the days of captivity. They were in captivity for 70 years, and now they're going back to rebuild Jerusalem, back to rebuild the wall, back to rebuild the temple. And so this is Ezra and, and, and Zerubbabel going back to build the temple. But they met resistance. Do you know every building project you're ever going to be in has some resistance involved in it. The, not everything goes swimmingly smooth. Y'all understand that? Ezra chapter 4, it says, when the people of the land then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. So Judah gets back into the land where they're supposed to be, the promised land. But there's already people there. There's a people there that when Judah got taken captivity away, the people that were not of, the, of Israel, they stayed in the land. And now they're trying to discourage them as they have come back. They troubled them in building their temple. Verse 5, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. You can probably bring me down just a little bit, brother. So what we see here is that they tried to discourage them. They tried to trouble them. They even hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Your purpose is going to meet some frustration. Hallelujah. Anything you're trying to do for God is going to meet some resistance. Your happiness is resisted by the devil. There is someone opposed to you. There's a devil and low flying devils and demons and all sorts of flesh and everything that's opposed to your happiness. But I'm telling you right now, don't you give up. No, because that's not the end of the story right here. Because God said, okay, they're trying to frustrate my people. God says, I'm going to raise up a prophet who's going to speak into the life of Israel. Look in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. The prophet said, Who are you, O great mountain? Mountain of difficulties, mountain of problems, mountain of resistance. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone, the very last stone in the building of the temple, with shouts of grace, grace to it. Everybody say that out loud. Grace, grace to it. To it, Yeah, amen. Verse 8, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. His hands shall also finish it, and then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the church said, Amen. amen. 
and amen. There's three great revelations here. First the revelation is mountains can be made flat. <laughs> can I say that again? Mountains can be made flat. That's the first revelation. The second revelation is your purpose in life, the things that God has put your hand to do, you can finish it. <laughs> That's the second revelation. And the third revelation is you have to speak favor or grace to your vision. First revelation is that mountain of resistance can be made flat. Second revelation is what God has put your hand to do, your hand can finish it. And the third revelation is that you have to declare favor or grace to your vision. Everybody say grace, grace to it. Zerubbabel was trying to build this temple. It took him 16 years. Ups and downs and starts and stops and resistance all along the way. People trying to discourage him. People trying to trouble him. People hiring other people to discourage them. To frustrate their purpose. But you know what? That mountain can be made flat. And the church said amen. amen. What your hands have started, your hands can finish. And the church said amen. But we have got to learn how to speak to our situation. We've got to learn how to say grace, grace to it. We've got to learn how to, you know what grace is, unmerited favor. We've got to learn how to say, no, I, there, the devil wants resistance in there, but I say favor on it. Uh, people are trying to stop me, but I say favor to it. Unmerited favor, preferential treatment to it. What, what I am feeling resistance in my life, I don't receive that resistance. I receive the favor of God. I, I receive the grace of God. So I say, grace, grace to it. Everybody say it out loud. Grace, grace to it. Let me tell you, that is a powerful phrase because when you get into your car on Monday morning to go to work and you turn the key and the battery's flat, you can get out of your car and say, grace, grace to it. <laughs> Rather than kicking that thing, you can say, grace, grace to it. Yeah, amen. I'll tell you a funny story. I was filling in, preaching uh, one time, and I was invited to preach, and... and um, I was getting in the car on that Sunday morning to go and, and preach as a guest minister, and uh, the battery didn't turn over. I know exactly what I'm talking about. The battery did not turn over, and I had no time to fool around with this thing because I had to be at somebody else's church to minister. Now, if it had been in this church, Pastor Tom, Pastor Cecil, Pastor somebody could have jumped in and preached a wonderful message, but I was a guest minister at somebody else's church, and so I was, I've got to be there. They're, they're playing on me being there. I've got to be there. I've got no time to mess around with this dead battery so I got out of my car I walked around to the front of that radiator I spoke to that car battery you are going to start in the name of Jesus Christ I got back in turned the key started right up glory to God hallelujah that's a true story hallelujah hallelujah mountains can be made flat what you put your hand to, you can finish. But we got to learn how to say grace, grace to it. I said we got to learn how to say grace, grace to it. Glory to God. Overflowing faith confessions, declarations of faith. Now let's talk about the principles of overflowing faith declarations. I got a little slide on this. The principles of overflowing faith declarations. Number one, what fills our hearts fills our mouth that's number one what fills the heart fills the mouth that's number one number two overflowing faith declarations focus on something here's number three overflowing faith declarations hold fast they never waver they hold fast here's number four speaking words of faith is like learning a foreign language. <laughs> and number five, overflowing faith declarations also are intended to encourage other people. You don't need to just be speaking faith over yourself. You need to be speaking faith over other folks. 
uh, especially your family, but then your church family, over your pastor, praise the Lord, over everybody, your boss, everybody. You need to be speaking that faith, speaking that faith, speaking that faith. Because if someone else is up against a mountain, you can speak to their mountain. You can say, mountain, be, be removed, body, be healed, finances, come in. You, you know, you can speak to that situation for them. Didn't Jesus do that for Mary and Martha when he spoke to Lazarus? Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Praise God. So, number one, principles of overflowing faith declarations. Number one, what fills the heart fills the mouth. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Look with me there really quickly. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everybody say that with me. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Isn't that a powerful connection? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. <gasps> I just learned something right there. Right there. It brings forth what? Good things. Things. Brings forth good things. Let's keep reading. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word man may speak, he will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified. By your words you'll be prospered. By your words you'll be peaceful. By your words you'll be joyful. By your words you'll be healed. By your words you'll have a breakthrough. By your words. You're... Why? Because they came out of your heart. And if your heart's full of faith, glory to God, that mountain's going to move. Uh, let me finish reading. For by your words you'll be justified, or by your words you will be condemned. Faith-filled hearts overflow out of the abundance of the heart, overflow with faith-filled words. Amen? Now, here's the interesting thing. They produce good things. I, I can set an atmosphere by the words that I speak. Come on, you know that. I can set a mood by the words that I speak. I can set a circumstance by the word that I speak. I can produce a spiritual result by the words that I speak. I can change the circumstances of my life by the words that I speak. You say, Wor words can't do that. Sure they can. God created the entire universe that we see with the utterance of his mouth. He spoke, it was, and it was good. Yeah. Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, that the things which were seen were not made of the things which are visible. So God reached into the invisible, spoke forth the universe, and made it visible. Glory to God. Someone say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can bring forth good things into your life when your words are words of faith. How does that happen? you got to have the heart of faith. you got to fill your heart, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So principle number one. What fills the heart fills the mouth, okay? What fills my ears fills my heart, then fills my mouth. What fills my eyes fills my heart, then fills my mouth. In other words, I'm the gatekeeper. I determine what I hear, what I receive in my gates, my ears, my eyes, my sensory perception. I'm the gatekeeper of what I allow into my life. Pastor Beverly taught Debbie and I early on, said, you don't have to agree with everything you hear. You can say, I fall out of agreement with that. If it's a negative word, a contrary word, if it's against your faith, if it's against your hope, you say, I, I, I disagree with that. I fall out of agreement with that. Jesus said it's only the seed that is sown and is accepted that brings forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. You got to hear it and accept it. If you hear something negative and accept it, they, somebody says, you'll, you'll never do that. And you say, well, maybe I will never do that. You just accepted a negative word, and that, that's going to become a reality in your life. So you need to learn how to say, you know what? I do not receive that. I fall out of agreement with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Faith has to overwhelm doubt because the world is filled with doubt. 
Everything around you is doubt. But there's negative influence all around us all the time. So your faith has to be bigger, has to be stronger, and overwhelm the doubt that the world wants to put onto you, wants to label you, wants to saturate you, wants to fill your heart with. And, and you have to say, no, my faith is stronger than that. James 1 and 6, one of the most important passages in Scripture, James 1 and 6. But if you, if you request anything of God, be, go a verse earlier. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all men liberally, upbraideth not. But, verse 6, but let him ask in faith no, with no doubting. Let him ask in faith with no doubt. Your faith has to overwhelm your doubt. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Your power level, your anointing level, your unction level, your mountain moving ability depends on your faith level. And if your faith part of the time and doubt the other part of the time, let not that man think that he is going to receive anything of the Lord. It's the Word of God. It's only the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's only the Word of God. No word of doubt, only Word of God. No word of doubt, only Word of faith. No word of contrary word, only positive, faith-filled words for my ears. I only want to hear positive stuff. I only want to hear, you can do it. I only want to hear, praise the Lord. I only want to hear, you're on the victory side. I only want to hear, yeah, man, keep going, man. You got it, man. Come on now. Are you with me? And that's all I want you to hear. And if, listen, David had to encourage himself. Said, it says David, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And so if, if no one else has encouraged you, you encourage you. If you have to get in front of your bathroom mirror every single day and say, you know what, me and Jesus make a winning team. I am more than a conqueror. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm a tree planted by rivers of living water. My leaf does not wither. I bring forth and fruit in due season and everything I put my hand to will prosper. Hallelujah! Say, I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise in the things of the Lord. I got wisdom for everything I face today. Glory to God. I'm not going to be overwhelmed. I'm going to be the overwhelmer. Glory to God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's number one. That's number one principle of having overflowing faith confessions. Here's number two. Overflowing faith confessions focus on something. You say grace, grace to it. There's an it involved. When, when you deal in generalities with your faith, it generally helps you. But if you deal with specifics in your faith, that's when you move the mountain. You speak to the mountain. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever shall say to this mountain, to this mountain, be thou removed and cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believeth those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. You, you speak to something. Now, you can be very general in your faith. Lord, I, I hope I have a good day. That's, that's a good general statement. That's a wonderful statement. It's a general statement. And generally, it helps with generalities. But when you speak to the specifics, the, the absolute specifics of your desire, come on now, that's when God starts to sharpen the pencil. That's when angels say, okay, I know exactly what I need to do here. That's when things start to line up specifically. So you speak to the mountain. Grace, grace to it. Grace, grace to my finances today. Grace, grace to my health today. Grace, grace to my, you know, to my marriage, to my kids. Whatever the it might be, that's what you speak to. Get specific. I said, get, get specific. Get down to the detail. Get down to the nitty-gritty. Glory to God. Speak to your passion. Speak to your assignment with specificity. If you need uh, uh, $1,000, Lord, 
thank you for my $10,000. <laughs> have a little extra spread around. Come on now. Uh, thank you for my $10,000. Thank you for my $10,000. You know, he gives you all sufficiency for all things that you may have an abundance for every good work. Yes, he does. That's what the Bible says. So you say, Lord, thank you. And you speak specifically to your need. I said speak specifically to your need. Glory to God. Here's, here's rule number three. Here's the third characteristic of overflowing faith declarations. Here's the third one. Hold fast. Faith declarations hold fast. They don't waver. They hold fast. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Can't be in, can't be out. Hold fast. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Everybody say, without wavering. For he... For he is faithful that promised. So I'm not going to waver because my faith is built on his promise. My faith is based on his promise. And he's got the character to always back it up. He's not going to pull a promise away from me. So in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, flick back a page or two, it says, But Christ is the Son over His own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. I have confidence because He promised, He who promised is faithful. That's the best way to say it. I am confident because he who promised is faithful. So number three is your faith declaration it must hold fast. Hang on to that faith declaration. Don't give up on that faith declaration. Don't go by your eyes. Don't go by what people are saying. You stick to your faith declaration. I am what the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. 2 Timothy 1 verse 13 Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith. Hold, hold fast the pattern. Hold fast the pattern. Hold fast the pattern of sound words in faith Amen. and love which are in Christ Jesus. Hang on to them words. Amen. By his stripes I am healed. I'm hanging on to them. My God shall supply all my need according to abundant riches in Christ Jesus. I'm hanging on to them. Amen. Now unto him who can do abundantly above all that I could ask or think. I'm hanging on to them. Hallelujah. You hang on to those sound words. Don't give up on those sound words. Hold fast. Here's number four. Speaking words of faith is like learning a foreign language. Before we came to Jesus, we spoke the language of doubt and unbelief. Look with me real quickly in Ephesians chapter 4. I'll read the New Living Translation for clarity. The, the language of doubt, everybody's fluent in doubt and negativity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles. That, that would mean unbelievers in this passage. As the unbelievers do, for they are hopelessly confused. Say, I was there once. Yeah, verse 18, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They harden their hearts. Well, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if the heart is hard, the word hard, the words are going to be equally as hard. They're not going to be faith-filled words. They're going to be doubt-filled words. They're going to be hard words against you. So he said, the unbelievers have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. So there's, there's the language of doubt that everybody speaks. Everybody speaks. But then you come to Jesus. Glory to God. Look in verse, verse 20. But that isn't what you've learned about Christ. That isn't now. You've learned a new language. You've learned the language of Christ. You've learned the language of being a child of the living God, of being a citizen in the kingdom of God. Glory to God. Is that me snapping, yeah. clicking? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody bring me some new batteries. And while you get me some new batteries, I'll keep going. But I'll stand very still. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Verse 20. But this isn't what you've learned about Christ. 
Hallelujah. You got some? Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take this short intermission. <laughs> Speak to the batteries. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> Batteries, you will not fail me. All right, <laughs> God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Tonight we're preaching on the 23rd Psalm. And, uh, no, wait a second. Hallelujah. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. Now we're in verse 20. So we're not speaking the language of doubt anymore. Now we're speaking the language of faith. But that isn't what you've learned about Christ. We've learned a new language. Verse 21. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old nature, your former way of life, your former way of thinking, your former way of speaking, which was corrupted by lust and deception instead. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes put on the new nature created to be like uh, God truly righteous and holy praise the Lord the old language of doubt is gone but we slip back to it too easily because we're around it all the time but the new language of faith is what we must walk in because life comes by Faith, speaking the words of faith. It's funny. Uh, people that are bilingual, I just think they're fantastic because now they've got uh, double the possibilities of reaching someone for Jesus. They Automatically. They've got two, two, double the possibilities of reaching someone for Jesus. And so I've been trying to learn Spanish and... Um, uh, muy malo. It's very difficult. <laughs> it's very hard. Uh, starting at 60, it's very difficult. And, but in, this, in the school I was a principal of, I would start my kids in kindergarten. And every day they'd have a Spanish lesson on through. And they picked it up just like little, little sponges. But I'm starting at 60 trying to learn some Spanish. And so I'm learning Spanish phrases and, and different things that no, not fluent at all. But I'll ask people, how do you say uh, I want want to be um, peaceful. How do you say that in Spanish? I will ask somebody that. How do you say that in say, Alex or somebody usually here at, at work? Say, Alex, how do you say that? Or Pastor Wine, how do you say that? And uh, so, um, yo quiero ser uh, pacifica. Pacifico. Praise God. And so uh, they'll, they'll tell me. And, but the same, the same is true of faith. We, we ask, Holy Spirit, how, how do you say, I want to be healed in kingdom language? And the Holy Spirit says, this is how you say it. By His stripes, you are healed. How do I say, I want to be uh, healthy, wealthy, and wise? Brethren, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Y'all understand? And so... The Word of God is the language of God. That's the language of the kingdom. That's the language of faith. And so when we ask the Holy Spirit, how do you say I want to be an overcomer? How do you say I want to be healed? How do you say I believe in miracles, signs, and wonders? And the Holy Spirit is our tutor in the language because Jesus said, don't, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all things that I have spoken unto you and the church said amen and amen the church said amen and amen now here's the last one number five overflowing faith declarations encourage others too 
uh, Minister George is so good. He sends Debbie and I an encouraging word and, and uh, texts, texts us to it and, and uh, just a blessing to us. And it's a word of faith. It's always a word of faith and a word of encouragement. And it, it just stirred in me that so much of our faith is not just for us, but it's for those around us, speaking life into other people, speaking that word of encouragement and that uplifting word into the life of other people. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And the church said, amen and amen. So, faith-filled words, declarations of faith. Number one, what fills your heart fills your mouth. Number two, overflowing faith declarations focus on something. Number three, overflowing faith declarations hold fast without wavering. Number four, speaking words of faith is like learning a foreign language. And that's what we come to church for. We're learning the language of faith. They say if you really want to learn a language, you need to be submerged in the culture. You, you just got to depend on it. You got to be in a place where everybody else speaks that language because eventually you're going to get hungry and you're going to ask somebody, where's the restaurant? <laughs> Donde esta la restaurante? You know, you're going you're gonna to have to come up with where is it? Where's the food? And so you got to get submerged into that culture so that you learn the, the language. Glory to God. And then number five, overflowing faith declarations encourage others also. And the church said amen and amen.